Hi everyone, this is the exam review for chapters 10, 11, and 12. Um, so let's finish up with adolescence by talking about identity versus rule confusion um, and how um, in that period of adolescence, there are lots of different roles that they're taking on there. Um, in addition to the roles that they already had, they're now trying to decide who they are as a citizen, who they are um, with respect to religion, who they are with respect to uh, perhaps politics, um, what kind of a job they want to have, what kind of a co-worker they want to be, what kind of a friend they want to be. Um, they may be starting to have romantic relationships and try and decide how they want those to go. So there are lots of different roles that they're taking on um, and they're trying to do well at all of them um, and it can seem overwhelming to them at certain times. Um, Marcia's theory of identity development builds on Erickson's identity versus role confusion um, by talking about it with respect to crisis and commitment. Um, crisis being a period of active exploration, a, a relatively positive thing, but something that requires work. Um, and commitment, committing to a particular course of action. So um, there's another video that I've made that's just on that, so you can watch that if you need to for a refresher. Um, but briefly, um, if they're not working on it at all, that's an uh, identity status of diffusion, and it's not a great place to be because it's hard to progress beyond that. Um, there's the identity status of moratorium, which means that they're actively exploring options, they're thinking about things, they're struggling in some way. So crisis is relatively high, um, but commitment is low because they haven't uh, reached um, a course of action yet. Um, and that's a good thing because they, there's a lot to explore and there are a lot of options, um, and you can waste a lot of time going down a road um, that you haven't thought out and then having to backtrack, and so that's not optimal. Um, and that road, you know, going down that road would be indicative of the identity status of foreclosure. So uh, foreclosure is when um, a decision is made too quickly um, and not enough options are considered um, and um, it lends itself to later on being either dissatisfied with the choice that you've made or having to go back and revisit that period of crisis and exploration going back to the moratorium stage. Um, so foreclosure is not great. Um, it doesn't mean that people who make a decision early or quickly are always wrong. Um, they're not always wrong, but that's the risk that they take um, if they haven't really thought it through uh, well enough and looked at enough options. And then the identity status of achievement is just what it sounds like. Um, once crisis has been, or active exploration has been engaged in, and a course of action has been selected, um, well then that, uh, that gets you to identity achievement. And throughout the life course, uh, people tend to, especially as um, working careers get longer and life gets longer, we go back and forth as adults between moratorium and achievement. We try and redefine ourselves sometimes. Um, and that can look like a midlife crisis, but really it's a midlife review um, saying, hey, you know, I've been doing this for a while, perhaps I'd like to do something else, um, and going back to moratorium, exploring other options, and then going to achievement. So that cycle is called a mama scale, or mama cycle, excuse me. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about in this chapter um, is that concept of adolescence limited offenders and life course persistent um, offenders. Um, when I ask students in class to uh, confidentially or anonymously um, say you know, anything that they did as an adolescent that they wouldn't do again, um, they write them on cards and, and I mix them all together with several class sections. And what I get is a really long list of uh, things that are against the law. Um, most of them are, are relatively minor, but, um, but they're still against the law. And if they were caught, um, depending on how they were treated, um, if, uh, if they were given a warning or if they were given a ticket or if there was a punishment that didn't involve being incarcerated, um, then it's likely that they would remain a uh, adolescence limited offender and after age 21 would not continue um, to break the law um, in that way. Uh, for life course persistent offenders though, that's a different trajectory. Um, and that leads to, or that is um, descriptive of um, individuals who continue to um, break the law and continue to um, be in trouble with the law um, as adults. Um, so that's the difference there. Um, most adolescents who break the law um, do not go on to become an, uh, a life course persistent offender. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're um, thinking about that. Um, chapter 11 uh, is the chapter on emerging adulthood. And this chapter is um, both uh, physical development, cognitive development, and psychosocial development all in one chapter, which is new for this book um, in the sense that in all the other chapters we have two, in all the other age ranges we have two chapters. Um, and the reason for that is this is a relatively recent carve out for the lifespan. Um, it's, you know, um, all of the sections of the lifespan are social constructions. The word adolescence is a social construction. The idea of adolescence and saying that there's this period of the lifespan where 
you're almost adult-like but not held completely responsible for the decisions that decisions that you make um, you know similar to that we've now carved out emerging adulthood which used to be all adolescence so um, when I was in graduate school um, adolescence was from age 11 to about age 25 um, and I can tell you that lots and lots of college students um, who are in their 20s do not appreciate being called an adolescent because they feel very adult like and they are very adult like they um, they have jobs they have cars they have homes they have children sometimes you know all kinds of things that are more adult like than more adolescence like they have more in common with adults on that level than they do with 16 year olds on the other hand they're still changing pretty rapidly. Um, so Jeffrey Arnett and his colleagues carved out this, uh, this um, part of the lifespan, labeled it emerging adulthood, and now we're starting to study that. But it's only been in the last 15 years or so that we've been doing that. Um, so there's less research in that area, um, and, uh, and that's why you're, you're finding it all in one chapter. Um, with respect to our course, um, I think the important things to think about are things like stereotype threat and how that can influence um, outcomes for college students and even beyond college, um, when you uh, feel like you are part of a group that's being stereotyped, and it's a negative stereotype usually, like no one really cares if they're in a group, not that no one cares. Um, no one is concerned or worried about people thinking that they're doing a really great job. Um, what they're concerned about is underperforming um, and then having that reflect poorly on their group um, and confirming a negative stereotype. Um, so stereotype threat um, can depress your performance because it adds a, a layer of stress onto an already uh, difficult or challenging task. Um, and you don't have to believe the stereotype to be influenced by it. In other words, uh, if it's a stereotype about what women can do and you're a woman, um, you don't have to believe the stereotype, but you'll still be influenced by it because while you're doing that thing, you're trying to do that thing and also prove that the people who hold a negative stereotype about your group are wrong. So, um, so that stereotype threat, that's the work of um, Claude Steele and Joshua Aronson um, and their colleagues and um, very interesting research. Um, in emerging adulthood, um, we talk about post-formal thinking. So taking, you know, Piaget stopped at formal operational thinking. Um, now you have post-formal thinking, which adds another level of complexity onto the way that, uh, that we are um, thinking about the world, thinking about um, logic and possibilities, hypothetical thinking. Um, you know, I have to say, uh, it's uh, one of the early researchers on this was um, Gisela Labovivif um, and others who, who've done just a, a tremendous amount of work and it's really interesting to think about post-formal thinking, um, but it can be a hard concept to wrap your head around. So um, review that section of the book and let me know if you have questions about that. Um, massification. Um, massification is education or higher education in particular for the masses. Um, the idea that um, not just in our country but in many countries many more people are going to college, um, are expected to go to college for the jobs that they want to hold um, and also you know it, it's in the best interest of the economy, the country, the society um, to have an educated populace. Um, so more and more people are going to college for, for lots of reasons just like you. Um, so um, that the term for that is massification um, and it, it encapsulates the idea that um, lots of jobs in the workforce now require college that didn't require college uh, a generation or two ago um, and so um, things are changing in that respect. Uh, plasticity, um, as, a, um, as an emerging adult uh, what you may find is stability in personality, stability in many of the decisions, decisions that you make, um, the things that you like, things that you don't like, um, much more stable than in uh, middle childhood and adolescence, um, but still making changes, still improving things, still changing your mind about things. Um, and so plasticity that we talked about earlier in the semester comes up again in this chapter. Um, and then the last thing for this chapter um, is uh, intimacy versus isolation. It's Erickson's stage. Um, and um, intimacy being uh, intimacy like sharing um, your secrets with somebody, um, sharing information with somebody, trusting somebody um, versus being isolated. And so emerging adulthood is a time when um, people are forming relationships, trying to think about how they want to live as an adult. Do they want to live with somebody? Do they want to live alone? Um, do they want to live with more than one person? Um, how do they want to structure that? So in adolescence, it was role confusion or identity, um, and now it's moving into intimacy and forming relationships with other people. Um, okay, and the last chapter for this uh, for this video, um, chapter 12, is the beginning of adulthood. Um, and in adulthood, um, it starts out by talking about um, and defining the term senescence. 
Um, senescence is a word for the inevitable biological aging that we all go through. Um, so you're starting to see it in adulthood and it's something that will continue through the end of the lifespan and so we'll continue to talk about it. So um, that comes up early in this chapter and I think it's an important term um, because it reminds us that there are certain aspects of aging that we can't do anything about, um, that that, uh, that train is moving forward, so to speak, um, and, uh, and we're on it, whether we want to be on it or not. Um, with respect to intelligence, um, in the cognitive development section, um, the author talks about um, Spearman's G. So um, this is the general theory of intelligence, the idea that um, there's a, a general factor for intelligence and that uh, when you think about how smart somebody is, um, they are smart at, or you know, they're, they're accomplished or they're achieving at a particular thing. And Spearman's theory says, whatever they had chosen to do, they would have done well at that. So if somebody is an astrophysicist or a dancer or a basketball player or a, a biologist, um, all of those things uh, are, are great things um, and they require this level of general intelligence and to the extent that you excel, you'd be high in those things, um, but you would have been high in whatever you chose. Um, and so that's the general theory of intelligence. Um, we also talk about fluid and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence being um, quick thinking, uh, novel, you know, novel approaches to things, creativity, um, that tends to peak early in adulthood and decline somewhat over the rest of the lifespan. So as a 25 or a 30 year old, somebody might be at the peak of um, their fluid intelligence, um, and then that would decline, not dramatically, but decline gradually over the rest of the lifespan. That's in contrast to crystallized intelligence. So crystallized intelligence, if you think about forming crystals, crystals don't go away. Um, crystallized intelligence doesn't go away. It's your accumulation of knowledge um, over the course of your lifespan and whatever it is that you know and know well now, you can expect to know at the end of your life. Um, dementia or memory loss um, is not a normal part of aging. So it's, you know, it's a disease and some people get it, um, but most people don't. And, um, and so crystallized intelligence um, uh, increases throughout the rest of the lifespan. So that doesn't, it does not decline. Um, Sternberg's tri uh, triarchic theory of intelligence um, is based on the idea. And so these are competing views of intelligence, just a different way of looking at it, asking and answering different questions, but all around the topic of intelligence. Um, Sternberg's theory was that there are three kinds of intelligence, um, a practical intelligence, sort of, you know, just street smarts, you know, you know, what can you do on the fly and, you know, and, and how good are you at that? Are you the person that somebody would want with them um, if they were stranded on a desert island? So that would be practical intelligence. Also creativity, um, coming up with new solutions to things and just being a, an out-of-the-box thinker. Um, and then analytic thinking, which is typically what, uh, what um, is measured in school. So people who are really good at analytic thinking or high in analytic intelligence from Sternberg's perspective um, are people who are doing well in high school, they're doing well in college, they're doing well in graduate school. Um, they can, you know, they're book smart. Um, so there's book smart, street smart, creative, um, a, you know, a, a, a different way of looking at intelligence than just having it be one general factor. And Sternberg thought that everybody had some of all three, um, but that they could be higher or lower um, in different capacities. Um, and, and that that was a good way to think about intelligence. Um, Shai's longitudinal study, um, the Seattle longitudinal study, um, I've talked about it in an earlier exam review and, I, and we've already talked about it in class. Um, this came up with respect to cross-sequential research in one of the early chapters. Um, but the, you know, the takeaway message from the Seattle longitudinal study is that um, in contrast to, um, uh, to cross-sectional comparisons, so comparing a 60-something person to a 30-something person and saying, hey, it looks like there's loss between 30 and 60, um, and when they did that across a number of, uh, of uh, cognitive abilities, what they found was that many things tended to peak in their 20s and 30s and decline for the rest of the lifespan. And that was a relatively pessimistic view of aging uh, in the second half of life. Um, but, but at the time, what they wanted, the question was, is it an accurate view? Like, it doesn't matter if it's optimistic or pessimistic, if it's right. Um, and so what they did was they, um, created this longitudinal study where they followed people across time. So the difference between you and me is our age groups, but it's also, you don't know how I was at your age. And so if you say the difference between a 30 year old and a 60 year old um, is, you know, there's a gap of this much, 
you don't know what this 60 year old was like as a 30 year old so you don't really know how much i've lost unless you've done a longitudinal study um, so what they did was uh, longitudinal research uh, where they followed people across time they followed adults across time starting in 1956 every seven years they studied those people again and then added a new cohort in so it enabled them to do those cross-sectional comparisons among age groups also to follow people across time to see how people were changing across time and not just in comparison to another age group and then also to see how age groups are changing across time that cross sequential element so what, what, what were 25 year olds capable of in 1956 what were 25 year olds capable of seven years later and 14 years later and 21 years later and so on um, so lots of different ways of being able to um, dissect the data um, and come up with uh, with other uh, explanations for how cognition is changing um, in the adult lifespan um, and what they found was um, the cross-sectional studies always showed uh, decline or in almost everything um, but that the uh, the longitudinal answer was very different and that was um, that things were relatively stable in fact some of them increased across the adult lifespan um, and you started to see declines um, more visibly in the 60s um, and even more so in 70s but it wasn't until about 80 that you saw a really sharp decline and that's a very different story than saying you're at your peak at 25 and it's all lost after that the one exception to that is speed of processing and speed of processing is biologically based um, it's influenced by things like myelinization um, of neurons in your brain and um, neuron neuronal loss in your brain all kinds of things and so um, that is something that we can't really do anything about um, or at least yet and we can't do anything about um, and so that does show decline um, from relatively early in adulthood throughout the last throughout the um, rest of the lifespan um, but for the other uh, mental abilities um, there's a, a an amazing amount of continuity stability um, and even growth in some areas so that was a very different story um, and that's based on their data and that's an ongoing study um, emotion focused and problem focused coping um, different styles of coping with adversity um, emotion focused coping is your best bet when it's something that you can't do anything about so if there's a problem that that uh, is it needs to be coped with so it's usually something negative um, then uh, coping with it using an emotion if, if it's something that you can't do anything about um, well you can't do anything about it but you can make yourself feel better so um, you can remember more positive things about it or you can look at pictures or you can eat ice cream or go for a run um, none of that changes the underlying problem but it can make you feel better about it so that's emotion focused coping the contrast to that is a style of problem focused coping if it's something that you can do something about then your best bet is to address the problem break it down um, use whatever problem solving strategies are available to you to address the underlying problem so different uh, different strategies um, for coping with adversity uh, selective optimization with compensation um, the theory of Paul and Margaret Baltus um, and that's the idea that as we age there are things that are going to change um, and we're not going to necessarily be able to do everything that we did as a young person as we get older so um, at 60 you may be able to do all the things that you were doing at 30 but you may not be able to and that varies um, that's an, uh, a within individual variation um, so um, so what do you do about that um, well in terms of successful aging one approach can be select out of the things that you can still do the things that are important to you optimize those to compensate for things that you can no longer do and an example of that might be um, somebody who really likes sports who likes to be um, super active might not be able to do all the things that they could do before perhaps they aren't as good at um, squash or handball perhaps they're not you know their eye hand coordination isn't what it was um, so they don't feel like they can play at the level that they were playing before well they can choose another sport that requires less eye hand coordination or perhaps less speed um, uh, reading um, if people uh, really like to read um, they can listen to audiobooks um, if uh, vision is a problem for them um, so you know there are all kinds of ways that we compensate for changes both in uh, physical aging but also in cognitive aging um, oops, sorry um, to optimize uh, what we can do um, and compensate for things that we either can't do or can't do as well as we did before um, um, and then lastly um, automatic and intuitive thinking um, you know we've talked about this before um, the idea that um, there's certain things that we just uh, we're not even we're not even aware of what we're doing we just um, we just uh, feel like something is right we feel like it's the right answer um, and often that is based on a lot of processing going on in our brain that we're not consciously aware of um, and so sometimes though into those intuitive um, 
the conclusions that are based on intuitive thinking um, can be correct. Um, and, and they're correct based on a lot of data um, that's being worked on in your brain, but it's being worked on so quickly um, that you're not consciously aware of it. So um, just an interesting thing to think about when you um, think about how we make um, snap decisions and then um, try and correct for them or try and do more work when we have the time to do it. So um, that's it for chapters um, 10, 11, and 12. Um, the next uh, video will be for chapters 13, 14, and 15, and also that epilogue chapter, the um, uh, chat, well, I call it chapter 16, but the book calls it the epilogue. So, all right. Thank you. Bye.